and welcome to the show. Now, presidential aspirant and media owner Dumebi Kachiku says if elected president of Nigeria in 2023, he will support technology driven education and healthcare system to stop medical and education tourism abroad. Kachiku, who is contesting on the platform of the African Democratic Congress, says if elected, his administration will eliminate corruption by ensuring that Nigerian workers are properly remunerated channeling the vast energies of youths to productive ventures and collaborating with state governments to invest in power generation. He promises to build broadband internet infrastructure across the country. He decried the state of the nation urging Nigerians to remain resolute and not be discouraged by the attitude of political leaders. According to him, the government does not lack ideas on how to run the affairs of the nation, but the political will to do what is required to tackle the nation's socio-economic woes is the major challenge. Well, I'm glad to have in the studio with me here Dumebi Kachuku, who is the presidential aspirant of the African Democratic Congress. Uh, so good to have you here. Thanks, for, have, thanks for having me, Sumna. Well, uh, in a crowded space of so many Nigerians who want to be president, I mean, we've never <laughs> seen this huge number of persons being interested in the country. Uh, but, you know, this is also coming at a time when the country is facing very, very critical challenges and not many Nigerians say that they pity the next president of Nigeria. What gives you the confidence that uh, you will win the ADC presidential uh, ticket and then eventually emerge president next year to do this great job? <laughs> well, well, what's happening to Nigeria right now is like um, you're passing by and you see a building burning and everybody just jumps in trying to put out the fire. So that's why you have this race crowded right now. Everyone sees that Nigeria is born and most people believe, let me do something about this fire. Let me try and put out this fire. That's why, that's why this race is crowded. Uh, my party, the African Democratic Congress, has about nine aspirants, I believe, at, um, at this point, uh, four women in the race, you know. And, um, so, and you have people on that platform who are intellectuals, people, notable people, people, uh, people of caliber people have what it takes and it's it makes it has made the race very very interesting in fact i hear that we have two more people joining us in the next 48 hours which is going to make the primaries very very exciting why do i think that um i will win the primary as well um till june 1st i believe that um what most people see people are looking for capability right people are looking for someone who's got heart who's got courage who's who um who identifies with the issues and who not just talks about problems also has solutions to the problems. I think that that's what I bring to the table. I think that's what they're noticing and that's what makes them um, energized right now. But till June 1st, we'll see. And let's talk about um, the major challenges facing the nation indeed. What is that one critical issue that's at the forefront of your decision to decide to contest for the office of president? One critical issue, I can't say, say one critical issue. It's a myriad of issues. Um, we are facing multiple failures. Yeah, but you can't face all of them at the same time. T we have to face one major one. That's, you see, a lot of people keep on making that mistake, thinking that, you know what, you have a bucket that is leaking, you know, 20, 20 leaks. And you think that if you plug one leak, that that solves the problem. No, you have to have a multi-sectoral output to all your problems right and all our problems are interconnected just for example it's just like a human body right if you have one one system one organ failing it affects the whole body so we have to have a multi-sectoral approach to all our problems security we're failing education healthcare, we're failing in all sectors we're, fa we're failing even understand our charter as nigerians who are we what are we what are we selling to the world who do we project ourselves to the world as right so these are all the problems we have to solve but back to your question what did i see for me, it was the fact that um, I started living a life where every day my kids would go to school now wonder, will I get to see them when they come, when they see them in the afternoon? As I'm driving home, I'm wondering, will I get back home safe? I live in Abuja, a suburb of Abuja is supposed to be safe, but we've witnessed situations where we've, had, we've seen kidnaps happen in Asokoro. Um, sometime last year, someone jumped into our compound try to uh, break into our house this is a house surrounded with embassies government lodges but someone was desperate enough to do that so that fear just understanding that you know what it could be me next everyone just thinks that oh you know what it's far from them we saw Boko Haram um, start in the north I felt it was very very far 
South Northwest is still very far. We saw kidnapping start in South East is far. It went to Southwest, it's still far. People in Lagos never thought to come to them, but now they are all living in fear. In Abuja, we are living in fear. Guarimpa is under attack. Kuje, the whole metropolis of Abuja is under attack now. That's why. It's the fear that, you know what, if one doesn't do something about this, it could just happen to me. I don't want that to happen. How much of this country do you know? How many states have you told? And are you already meeting delegates of your party to sell your vision to them? Okay. Um, my late father was a federal high court judge. Um, so I grew up in Kanu. I went to primary school in Kanu, finished my primary school in Lagos, moved to Benin, um, um, lived a bit of my life in um, Edo State before I left the shores of Nigeria. Came back to Lagos again, been in Abuja. In the course of this, um, this uh, electionary campaign, I have moved about. I have done consultations in the Southwest. Um, yesterday I was supposed to go to Akwaibom for South South, but uh, unfortunately the aviation crisis, that didn't happen. So we have to, we have to use Zoom. But do I know Nigeria very well? Absolutely. Um, I've been a part of the political process for the last two decades. I've moved around. I know um, Nigeria uh, very, very well. You know, so one has a bit of understanding of um, um, the different um, the flavors of Nigeria. Let me put it that way. Okay, and uh, how much of your delegates have you met to actually let them know that, look, there's a need for uh, a different approach to issues? I mean, because you can't be the party's presidential uh, candidate if you don't have these delegates voting for you and all of that. So I'm interested to know how many states you have visited at the moment and what the reception is Okay, like. so my approach to delegates, I'm taking them on a zonal basis. I've met with Southwest, I've met South South. Um, tomorrow I'm meeting North Central delegates, and next week I'll meet Northeast, I'll meet Northwest, I'll meet Southeast. So I'm taking them on a zonal basis. Our primaries are just around the corner, so I don't have time to visit every state. So I'm bringing them together to um, a location and meet with all the delegates. So that's the first interface with them. Then we're also corresponding, using technology, corresponding with them day by day on chats, WhatsApp, Telegram, and what have you, you know, energizing them, getting them to understand what the issues are. Unfortunately, um, like most other parties, um, the, the major challenge facing my delegates are Nigerian problems, you know, the economy, security, right, um, uh, the issue of failed leadership. So when you're talking to them, uh, for most people, you know, you, you have to get through the effects of the economy they are feeling, first of all. And when we're approaching a, a new approach with our party, you need to... Um, start talking to delegates to get them not to approach politics where um, we don't want money back politics, right? And so if someone is uh, economically challenged, the first thing you think about, oh, um, how do I benefit from this? But our party has to a large extent, has done a good job to a large extent to ensure that this is not the approach, especially with the caliber of people contesting this part. So it's an issues-based approach, getting the people to understand what the issues are. And uh, I'm, I'm interested to know, actually, if indeed you are not afraid about some of the commentary by people in the ruling or progressive Congress and even the People's Democratic Party, that political parties like yours are not viable platforms to win the presidency. <laughs> what do you make of that? Because, I mean, you don't have enough structures. A lot of Nigerians don't know your political party yet. So and you I'm haven't done a lot of marketing of uh, the party itself. The ADC uh, came third in the last elections, um, uh, but it's not about coming third because we're not in this to come third, right? We're in, we're in this to win. So let me say this, right? A lot of people believe that politics is about the structure. They think that the structure is about having buildings in every ward, every unit. And that's not what these two parties have. A structure is the people, is the aspirations of the people in those parties, right? Which is why ADC has thrown this platform open to everyone. Women, youth, people with disabilities, it's free for them to contest. We're encouraging these people to come and contest because the aspirations of the House of Assembly member drives the, drives the aspiration of the House of Rep person, then the senator, then the Guba aspirant, then the presidential candidate. So we build our structure on their aspirations. Perchance we're not able to get people to run for all those races. Tell you what's going to happen. We're watching the political drama, or comedy going on with the two parties <laughs> right now, right? So what's going to happen? First week of June, when the dust clears and all settles, Nigerians will wake up and realize that, my goodness, same usual suspects. These two parties presenting us with the usual suspects? Nah. They'll say to themselves, you know what? We need to look somewhere else. They'll start identifying the other parties and see how they can align with those parties. There's something else we're preaching. In the last two decades of um, our fledgling democracy, what we've noticed is that 
about 10 million people every four years determine who is the president of Nigeria. 10 million people. 90% of them from the rural areas. People who are energized with Gary, Rice, rappers, right? People like you and I in the urban centers hardly vote. Over 40 million eligible voters who don't understand that it's their patriotic and civic duty to vote. Two things scare them. My votes don't count electioneering violence. But that is something that has been sold to deter them, to discourage them from voting. Because the ruling party knows that if these people vote, they will vote them out. They don't care for the rice and Gary. They just care about the issues. How does this issue pertain up to me or affect me? Right? So those are the people we are targeting right now. The people like you and I in the urban centers get them to get their PVC. Yeah, and they will also be interested in knowing your, your policy direction. For example, let's talk about you coming from the South-South uh, that produces or lays a golden egg <laughs> for Nigeria. I want to know what your policy will be like in terms of fuel subsidy, for example. Uh, should we remove fuel subsidy as Nigeria or we should continue to have it to ameliorate uh, the economic conditions of the poor, like the ruling party and the main opposition have been saying? So, um, if you see what President Buhari was trying to do with the forced subsidy, it was a very, very hard bullet, right? Remove it and it affects the poor. But what we have seen in the last decade is that the rich are the only ones benefiting from the forced subsidy. It's a corrupt enterprise, right? So, we need to take difficult decisions and remove that forced subsidy. But remember President Jonathan was trying to do something when he was trying to remove his forced subsidy. Social amenities, transportation, invest in those. They bought buses, where are those buses? They've not done that, right? But we need to do this. Nigeria cannot afford to continue one more year of false subsidy. We are borrowing to pay for false subsidy. Yeah, and what will be the alternative that you will be offering? So the alternative is to remove the false subsidy, the savings, use it to invest in social infrastructure. And you think Nigerians will agree with you? Tell Wouldn't you, wouldn't you face the same Occupy Nigeria kind of uh, protest that this government is running okay, away from that in, happened under Jonathan? In the last three months, how much are you paying for diesel right now? The middle class has been wiped out. We're paying over 700, 700 naira for diesel right now. It just happened. We're dealing with it. We're dealing with it. In the southeast, in some parts of the north, they are paying above the pump price, over 200 naira above the pump price for petroleum products. That's, that's been their lot for the past 10, 12 years. And they are dealing with it. The people who benefit from this subsidy are those of us in Lagos, places like Abuja and Port Harcourt. But most Nigerians are not benefiting from the subsidy. So why are we encouraging that subsidy? We need to get rid of it, take the money and put in social amenities. That's what Nigerians need. In 2022, Nigerians don't have light. They don't have water. They don't have transportation. They don't have good roads. We need to tackle all this headlong. Okay. And I'm interested to know how you tend to tackle the rising inflation rates in the country. Look at the exchange rates. It's about 600 Naira to uh, a dollar. How would you revamp the economy if given the opportunity by your party to contest the 2023 presidential election and if you emerge winner? It's simple. Um, we, ha we have a monofocal economy largely dependent on oil. Inflation is global right now. We have supply chain gaps and every single thing. But Nigeria, we have a unique problem. Our economy has failed because of the current policies of government concerned um, exchange rates and what have you. What will I do? We need to start looking away from the oil and gas sector. We need to start investing in Nigerians. We need to look at the informal sector. That is the mainstay of Nigeria. Yeah, but this is the same thing the but, Progressive but Congress they, said. They said that. When they were coming into power in 2015 and here we are. We'll tell you what. You know what? The biggest challenge we have in Nigeria is between policy and implementation. Right? We need people who will start implementing those policies. Remember, everyone has given us the solution. We know what the solutions are, but we just don't implement. That's what I will do. Take the informal sector where you have majority of the youths. When you start investing in those sectors, you go to a place like India. They take agriculture, for example. What? We need to create jobs here. So what do they do? They have um, agro-processing parks everywhere to ensure that, okay, you know what? You want to farm. Let's make it easy for you to farm. We have agro-parks. Take one hectare there, farm. You finish farming, we have people who guarantee to take off, take your produce. You go to the park where they are processing the food. It's easy for you. You, you want to process um, or, uh, oranges. They created a facility there. You don't have to go and take uh, a million dollars. They made it easy, $5,000. The government gives you, uh, uh, gives you grants or loans to make it easy for you to start. We don't invest in Nigerians. We only invest in the rich in Nigeria. We give subsidies to only the rich. We don't invest in Nigerians. We don't invest in the poor. 
we have nigerian youths of nigerians are the, some of the most intelligent people in the world imagine if you put a trillion naira behind these nigerians talking about twitter you're talking about L L L um uh, uh, what do you call it um uh instagram facebook Nigerians can do much better than that. I went to Dubai and found out that a Nigerian is actually behind the implementation of their power strategy for the next 50 years. What's happening to us here? We don't want to invest in these people. We want to keep on investing in the wrong, in the wrong areas. We are building bridges, dams, and roads that, go, that lead nowhere. When the internet, broadband is the highway of the future linking the whole world. So we keep on missing this. And tell you what, do you know why? We have a geratic leadership. We have people that can't understand modern day issues. That's the biggest challenge. Yeah. They can't understand modern day issues and we need to change the narrative. We need to bring young people who at least can even use technology, begin to use technology and understand what technology is about. And when you talk about Nigerian politics and the need to go for the presidency, you see the issues of ethnic divisions coming into play, the issues of zoning, it's time for the South, it's time for the North, and the controversial issue of religion playing a key role. Do you believe in Southern Presidency for 2023? And uh, what can you do about this debate of zoning? Should we do away with it? So I, I, I look at it in two ways. For the legacy parties, APC and PDP, um, they had a gentleman's agreement about zoning, right? And I feel they should honor that. Jonathan lost um, his seat because of that gentleman's agreement, right? So I think they should honor that that's what um, their party is based on. But tell you what, do I believe in that? We are talking, we need to start talking about meritocracy in Nigeria right now. Who can do the job best? Who is capable? President Buhari came into power because he felt it was the time of the not. But so when he came in, he had no qualms in, his nepo uh, in practicing nepotism, in his approach was governance, putting his family members, putting just northerners everywhere. He had no qualms doing that. They accuse President Jonathan of doing the same thing, that Igbos control everything. Now, I'll tell you what you will notice. When a Northerner is in power, right, a few people will benefit. The Northerners as a whole benefit. Look at the, what's happening in the North. They've destroyed the North. I grew up in the North. They've destroyed the place. Look at the Southeast. The place is imploding. It's burning. These same leaders who cannot talk to the so-called unknown government, their children, are coming to Abuja talking about... Um, power shift to a zone, an area they don't even control anymore. Look at what's happening in North. You saw what happened in Sokoto some days ago. We talked about religion. It was a clear failure of leadership. That happened to us all over the, all over the news. What did the leaders there do? Instead of coming out in a formidable manner to condemn that murder, they were all watching. Now, since they didn't say anything in me to, to condemn the murder, those people, the same mob, felt energized. Oh, these people are behind us. The next day, they went on rampage again when two perpetrators were arrested. That's because leaders failed. Yeah, and what will you do? Because a lot of Nigerians already know some of these issues. How will you ensure that there's rule of law, there's governance, uh, there's good governance that promotes, you know, equality across the states, irrespective of your religion or your region and all of that? Tell you what, I need to look at this camera when I'm saying this. If I'm president, you dare not, you dare not treat any Nigerian life as cattle, as chicken. You cannot take Nigerian life. The law will be against you. The law will stand against you. If I am president, you can't walk into Nigeria and feel that Nigeria is no man's land, where you can take over land and kill my people. That will never happen under my watch. If I'm Nigerian, I will, if I'm president of Nigeria, I will avenge the life of all my soldiers. I won't be in CNC and people take the life of my soldiers indiscriminately. That will never happen under my watch. Is that an I'll, indictment of President Buhari and That the is a clear indictment of the president who, as a former general, watches soldiers being killed every day. In the first four months of this year, would you believe that a nation at war, our troops were not even funded for the first four months of this year? We have to understand that Nigeria is broke, but even being broke, we still borrow for the wrong things. Well, the National Assembly has appropriated funds over and over. And I want you to talk about loans, the issues of loans. How do you intend to help Nigeria move away from all this payment of loans that we've been borrowing? And do you think we've actually invested those uh, loans very well? So uh, as a businessman, when you take a loan, right, you know that you are going to have, you have to pay back that loan. 
so your business plan supports you to pay back that loan what's happening in nigeria is that we have geriatrics right people who know they are there at the boarding gates right they're about to check out so they don't care they know that they are not the ones going to pay that loan so they can do whatever they want to do and they borrow for the wrong things so like i said they borrow to build bridges going nowhere or highways going nowhere what do we have to do we immediately have to renegotiate those loans we need to tell those people hard facts right you gave those loans knowing that these loans were not backed by any real mm. uh, any real critical projects we need to renegotiate this if you need to cut off from these loans do that uh, president uh, obasanjo did that before but now if we borrow everyone borrows americans are borrowing everyone borrows, but we need to borrow for the right things okay well i've just been told we have uh, less than two minutes left yeah i just want you to tell nigerians what experience you have individually that qualifies you to want to aspire to be president of nigeria what okay. businesses have you run before so tell you what, what right i'm a i'm a businessman who's done and who's doing multiple businesses in the areas of agriculture telecoms construction I operate, I do business in over 40 different countries, right? And my experience, you know, in having traveled over 120 countries, seeing what opens in those places qualifies me to know that, you know what, we haven't even started in Nigeria. That we have people, most of these people, their first experience of the real world or of, um, of another country is when they enter into office. So they enter clueless. I have been doing this for three decades. I understand what needs to be done. What needs to be done. I'm not going to get into office and try start trying to understand what the issues and try to grapple with those issues. There are issues I deal with every day: inflation, recession. There are issues I, I that I'm dealing with every day as a business person. So I come in there, understanding and knowing what needs to be done. But also as a business person, you take tough decisions on a daily basis. If something is not working, you get rid of it. If something is working, you support it to grow it. Very interesting indeed. Uh, just before we go, I just want to ask if your your brother, I mean, Ibe Kachuku, who is former Minister of uh, uh, State for Petroleum, is uh, behind you. I mean, does he support your ambition? We haven't <laughs> seen him saying anything. I mean, or going around with you to get delegates for you. So um, <laughs> let me let, let me say this. My brother finds me quite an interesting prospect, right? Um, he's watching. He is a father figure in our family. He, he's watching. He's watching to see what happens. Um, politics um uh, you, you know how politics people are, are in different parties in different families so at this <laughs> point he's he's watching he's impressed um he's he's encouraging um and he's watching to see what happens with the primaries and after the primaries then we'll talk okay <laughs> well <laughs> we can only wish you well in your ambition to become the flag bearer first of the african Democ uh, democratic congress and then before you go into the general election and hopefully win. Well, we must thank you so much, uh, Dumebi Kachuku, for joining us on the show to take a look at Nigeria, the problems of the country, and the solutions as you're uh, uh, proffering them right here. And we just hope that uh, it becomes well with the country after the 2023 polls. I hope so. Thank you so much. Yeah.